What is our practice? We get different suggestions, different insights. Barry, my teacher, always says, you can't do it wrong, which is good because you can't do it wrong. No right, no wrong. We'll get back to that. Um, another teacher whose instructions I like says, sit down, shut up. That's good too. Keep it simple. And yet, um, it's possible to sit down and shut up and not do the practice wrong exactly, but years later, find that you're just still sitting down and shutting up in the same kind of place. What's our practice for then? Um, well, again, we're in the Soto lineage of Zen, so we say it's for nothing. It is useless. There is no purpose to it. And yet, in a sense, if we truly believe that, we wouldn't be here. We don't do anything for no reason. So what are we expecting to get out of it? It's complicated. I always say that the heart of our practice is really Joko Beck's great insight that it's separation separation from this life that we are, this moment that we are, which is the expression of so much of our difficulty, so much of our trouble, so much of our apparent problems. We can call this separating ourselves off from life, separating ourselves off from reality, separating ourselves from the absolute, the kind of ground of all being. How do we do this separating? We separate when we turn away from our lives. Now, I was never fortunate to sit with her, but Joko was keen on quite physically tough sitting. Long sessions. Few creature comforts. She wasn't a fanatic about exact posture. No, you have to have your hands exactly so or you will fail. But what she was insistent on was sitting still, not moving. Why? Because we naturally want to move. We move all the time. We're in constant movement. Even when we're still, even when we're asleep, we're constantly moving or experiencing the inclination or even feeling the need to move. We fidget, we twitch. So to actually sit really still is to encounter resistance. To use another word that cropped up in one of our discussions the other week, is to exercise restraint. We feel the need to move, we want to move, we can't, we mustn't. And it's that, that resistance, that tension which is the separation or the impetus towards separation. Now we can extend this image of resistance and separation indefinitely out into psychic, social space, whatever. But it's very important that 
Joko kind of grounded it here in the immediate physical reality of sitting on my cushion. Why do I feel the need to move? It's not random. It may be the pain in my knee. It may be the pinched nerve in my hip. It might be that old injury in my shoulder playing up. Ah, yes, but it's also going to be the tension that I've carried in my shoulders since childhood when dot, 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 something happened. Or the queasy feeling that I get whenever that thought occurs to me and the way my stomach lurches a bit or the way I get butterflies in my stomach, my heart starts to beat a little faster. See, this is all real body stuff. And it's one of the reasons why I constantly try and bring us back to the idea of Zen as a body practice, as a physical practice. Because this is really where we suddenly encounter awareness. When I'm just responding, I don't have to be, well, no, when I'm just reacting, let's make a distinction there. When I'm just reacting, I don't really have to be aware at all. I just react. And if we're going to go into one emotion, which many, most of us find problematic to a greater or lesser degree, anger, when I'm reacting, if I'm probably male, probably with a certain kind of personality, I'll find that I've hit somebody without even being aware probably that I'm doing so. I saw red. Most of us can relate to that at some level. There's no awareness there. There's no real, yeah, literally awareness of what's going on. It's difficult. So we can contrast that with what's happening when I'm really aware of what's going on in my body. What are the signs? What, are the, what is the physical manifestation of my anger? Not the shouting, not the movement. What happens if I exercise that restraint? If I experience my resistance to sitting here? And don't just react. Well, it turns up as the tension here, the queasy feeling there, the racing heart there, the feeling that my head's going to explode a million different ways. But as soon as I begin to allow myself to experience that without just reacting, without just moving, suddenly, there's awareness there. I can begin to investigate that. I can feel the tension. I can feel the patterns begin to emerge in my experience. It gets interesting. So let's stick with the physical side for a minute. Of course, Buddhism has a long tradition of investigating the body um, and cultivating all kinds of awareness of the body. Mindfulness really involves a lot of awareness of the body and Buddhism invented the mindfulness movement, has expanded greatly on the idea of body scan meditation. We just float through the body and note everything there is to note. Or we can note everything there is about the breath. The feeling of my t-shirt moving across my chest as I'm breathing. The tiny hairs inside my nose twitching as I'm breathing. The difference in temperature. Smells feelings of pressure or ease, 
feeling my ribs slowly spreading, slowly coming back together again. The fact that the whole of my body is gently moving in this cycle of each breath. Now, all of those things are the kind of things that traditionally Vipassana meditation investigates. But here, we're interested as a way into the whole range of awareness, putting it all together. So we might focus in on something, we'll pull out the focus and see how much we can hold. Can I hear the sounds around my head at the same time as I'm aware of my breath coming in and out, at the same time as I'm aware of the physical weight of me sitting on the cushion? It's the kind of thing which long practice, sustained sitting, will develop. Now we can go one of several ways with this. We could say, this is getting through to the true ground of my experience, removing all the conceptual thought which is so debilitating, confusing, we could say, I'm trying to disassemble perception into its minute components. We could say, this is the action of the true self. But we wouldn't. We could say, um, We could say instead that I'm trying to grab, no, not grab, that's the wrong word entirely, isn't it? That I'm trying to be, yes, let's, let's use the word be, and I'll come back in a moment to why that might be an interesting word to be. Be this full experience of being, just this moment. Being not separate from the pain in my shoulder, not separate from the pain in my knee, not separate from the almost irresistible urge to shift my position, to twitch, whatever it is in this moment. See, we can go either way with this. We could say, oh yes, this is experiencing the fact that I am just this body. And that's perfectly true. But of course, I'm not only this body. I am this mind, these thoughts, this experience that I'm bringing in this moment. I'm all of this. Traditionally, Buddhism has sometimes said, I am not this body. And so I go through finding these minute awarenesses and going, well, is that really me? And the answer is, of course, not. We can even, and this is more problematic for us, I think, within, even within ordinary mind, um, we can even say, ah, there are all these experiences, these feelings, these physical sensations, and then there is the observer. I am not this body. I am that which stands behind it, that which observes it. And actually, once we really get into cultivating awareness, I think that's quite a common feeling. No, I can see I'm not these thoughts. I can see I'm not these physical feelings. Oh. Being, it's perfectly logical to think, I am therefore the witness, the observer standing behind these thoughts. I've just made myself separate from them. Subject and object, observer and observed. Oh, life separates out once more. This is why I think it's useful provided that we remember that to be is probably the most problematic 
word in the English language. What on earth do we mean by it actually? But to be this painful shoulder, to be this sore knee, to be this funny feeling, to be this emotion, this happiness, this joy, this misery, to be this thought that's running around in my head, because that is life, that is this moment. Again, we might want to say, but surely Zen is about not thinking, about learning to not think. You know, so much concept, you only give up picking and choosing. Well, this is where if we take Joko seriously, and if we say, we're not practicing to try and achieve some perfect state, and this really is important, so I'll say it again. We're not practicing to try and achieve some perfect state. We're practicing to experience the real resistance present in the need to separate and turn away from whatever it is in this moment. So, if I can be this thought without turning away from it, it's not a defilement, it's not a problem, it's not a failure. It's just this moment. The pain in my knee is just this moment. Listening to this talk is just this moment. Curiously, it's in Becoming aware, recognizing, acknowledging, accepting all of this as this moment, life, and in that sense, me. It has what we call a performative element to it. Performative in the sense that it takes somebody licensed, like a vicar, to say, I now pronounce you man and wife. Or, I arrest you in the name of the law. To say the thing, to be the person saying it, to be the right person saying it, is to make the thing happen. There's an image from one of Barry's books which seems to summarise this perfectly for me, and I hope this is the point at which this bit begins to make sense. Five-year-old child in the playground, playing on the swings, falls, stumbles, scrapes her knee, tears, gushing, despair, utter despair. The world in this moment has ended rushes over to mother, wraps arms around her. Come on, darling, let mummy kiss it better. And it does. It doesn't stop the blood. It doesn't stop the pain. But it changes nothing, but it changes everything. It's performative and awareness has a similar function if we let it be compassionate, if we let it be enfolding, if we don't stick with observer and observed, subject and object. Which is why I say, if we become this pain, this anger, this thought, this confusion, this suffering, and let the awareness transform it without separation and just this moment and this moment and this moment. So that's one possible version 
of our practice. And I come back to Barry's instructions for meditation, which I started with, which is, you can't do it wrong. It's vital that we don't think of awareness. It's vital that we don't think of the very real ways in which we can become more aware, practice awareness, cultivate awareness, as simply a trick, a skill that I can get better and better at. I can't really do awareness wrong. I just have to be aware <laughs> of the directions that it can go in and completely become an occupy and fill this body, this emotional space, this psychic space around me. And in a sense, well, how should we take this with Barry? Because in a sense, he needs us, Joko needs us to believe that we're doing it wrong. We will do anyway, so that's not a problem. He says, you can't do it wrong, but nobody believes me. Sad. But actually, the basic question of practice is, why do I think I'm doing it wrong? How does that make me feel? What's happening when I think I'm doing it wrong? Oh, look at the tension. Oh, I feel the need to move. Oh dear, that reminds me of dot, 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 dot. What so and so at work said. What happened when I was, you know, and suddenly it's all there because we're encountering the resistance. No resistance, no practice. No resistance, no learning. Really, no resistance, no life. It can't just be... That's not life. That's a different kind of fantasy. So... To borrow another word that Joker was fond of, let's suffer intelligently. Let's resist intelligently. Let's do it with awareness. Let's make this our practice.